welcome. That's Thanks very much. Lovely. Thank I'm just continuing. It's being recorded, which is fantastic. Thank you very much. And, the, the recording and, has uh, Great to see you, and Jackie and Vivian. Thank you so much for the lovely invite this evening. We're both delighted. Um, not that I'm talking on behalf of John. I'm only going to talk on behalf of myself. But um, thank you very much for to Ballyhara Development for the invite. It's great to be here. Now, we're chatting away um, this evening just about, well, everything to do with self-care. And the reality is self-care isn't relevant just for parents, it's everybody. Um, and I think it's important at the outset just to say that we are living in incredibly unusual times. I mean, it's, it's I don't like using the word abnormal, but there is nothing typical or usual or um, ordinary about life at the moment. And I think the, the fact that we don't have an end in sight, that makes it very difficult for everybody. So we don't have, you know, oh, well, by the 3rd of March, it'll all be gung-ho, but we'll all be able to travel to wherever we want and hug and kiss whoever we want. That's, that's causing difficulty for people. So it's important for us to exercise self-care as much as we can right now, as, with the view that in time, this will all change. It's very hard for us to imagine that humans that are in existence now ever had a pandemic, but there have been pandemics before. And it's so extraordinary to us because it's in our history and it's so far removed from our experience, but now we're right in one. This too shall pass. We will return to our ordinary things that we did before, but right now we simply have to do the best that we can. And exercising self-care, often people say to me things like, um, eh, you mean that's, that's being selfish with my time. You want me to exercise self-care, but be selfish. And exercising self-care, it's imperative, it is vital. It is not selfish. In fact, parents are probably, particularly moms, are prone to putting everybody else before themselves. People who have difficulty saying no will put others before themselves. And they're exactly the people who must make time to exercise. And I say exercise self-care, I mean make a plan of action for minding yourself. So what is self-care? It is everything that's going to keep us grounded and okay in the present. It's going to keep us right now, not floating off into the future and into our imaginary anxiety causing worries, not going back into the past and giving ourselves a really hard time about stuff that we might have done. So there's an element of controlling our thoughts as well as minding our bodies to mind our minds. That is exercising self-care. It's not selfish, it's imperative. And in fact, for parents, making the time for self-care is showing your children the importance of having a self-care regime. So you're teaching your child the importance of, this is why I go for a walk, this is why I lie down if I'm feeling tired, this is why I need quiet time, this is why I put on the music and dance and sing. You're explaining to your child all the time, these are the things that I do to help me feel okay. That is self-care, it's making that plan. John, did you want to? Oh, no, actually, can I, except to endorse that, and also to say, I suppose there'd be two elements of tonight, really. But the first element is around just the here and now, surviving, as I called it, the last time, and getting out of the other end. And, uh, you know, some of the stuff we'd be talking about would be exclusively almost for that particular period and for that challenge. But equally, we'd be talking about some of the stuff that you should also bring forward then into your normal life, in inverted commas, when, when this is all over because some of it is going to be, so actually some of the most powerful stuff we have, uh, you can't actually do it at the moment because of the restrictions in, in your travel and the restrictions of who you can meet and what you can do. So some of it will be very much, we'll be very conscious for the next half hour of trying to help people to cope with the present and survive the present uh, lockdown and all that goes with that. But we'll also be talking about things that you should do and be, be, be structuring into your life in relation to your own self-care for the future, because that will be a more, a more exciting bit, I think, anyway, of some of the things we'll be saying about that will be more exciting for you. 
in the sense that you'll be going out and meeting other people, getting your hair done, small little things that will make a huge difference to how you feel about yourself. So it's just on that. On the, but it does sound exciting, that. John, the idea that I don't have to cut my own friend. I mean, that kind of thing. So that will be something to look forward to for all of us, that whole ha hair care and self care. So right now, if nothing, if you take away nothing else from this evening, I would be really, really encouraging you to adapt changes to your sleep and to your exercise regime if you do nothing else. And the reason I, and that's right now actually. Um, so we don't have to wait for the pandemic to be finished or for level five to change. Um, I harp on about sleep all the time because it impacts every single facet of our lives. We don't really give it enough credit um, because we just, I think when we're sleeping well, we take no notice of it. And when we're not sleeping well, well, then it can be problematic. The first thing to do if you're not sleeping well is to stop worrying about not sleeping well. Sleep will come. If we start, if we wake in the middle of the night or if we're having difficulty falling asleep, what often happens is we start panicking and we're counting down the hours. Um, as in you wake at three o'clock and you're like, oh my goodness, I have to be up in four hours, I have to be up in five hours, or I can't believe I'm not sleeping, this is terrible. What if I never sleep again? Your body and your mind will in time adapt. So the first thing to, to, to do is not to panic about sleeping. And there are lots of different little things that you can actually do in terms of trying to uh, make your bedroom the most relaxed space possible. And this involves not having screens late at night because that interrupts your sleep cycle. Before I even get into the sleep actually, but they're the two things that I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep harping on about that. If nothing else, sleep and exercise or movement are, are the two things that will keep you. They're the best things for self-care, the best things protect, protectors of your brain health. The first thing I'm going to say in terms of exercising self-care is try to adapt a routine. Try to have a routine for the day, for the week ahead. It might sound very boring, but actually having a routine is going to help us get through the day. And that's what this talk is all about, is to try, try and improve your self-care. How can we get through the day? How can we get through the weeks until we are freed at, at last? Um, exercising, being disciplined about having a plan. We have to accept that this is where we're at right now at the moment, create a plan of action for the day and for the week ahead be relatively disciplined and I say be relatively disciplined because you can stick to a plan 100% life is messy things will come up that will disrupt your plan and that is fine too but having a good bedtime routine which involves you getting into bed at the, at the same time ish getting up out of bed at the same time ish and and I say ish that you can change but don't be staying up half the night watching Netflix or watching something on television, try to get into bed. That old adage of an hour before 12 is better than two after really does stand. So keeping good bedtime routines when you get up in the morning, eat a breakfast, be disciplined with your food, have that routine, a daily routine of where you're minding yourself and eating good quality food, ideally that you even made yourself. When you walk into the fruit and veg shop, Anything that's brightly colored, that's what you're eating. So you're minding what you put into your body. You're minding your body to mind your mind. But having a good sleep routine is imperative because it sets you up for the day. If you're trying to mind children and you're not feeling full of the joys of spring and you've had an interrupted sleep, the likelihood is you're going to be potentially more snappy, more tense, more terse, not as in control as you would be had you had a good night's sleep. But having a good night's sleep protects our brain health long term. It protects us, um, our cardiovascular system. Sleep is, it governs everything. And by having a proper routines, no screens in the bedroom, watching what we eat late at night, often people will say, well, look, I have a good glass of gin in the evenings and it knocks me out and away we go. I'm like, that is not the solution to having a good night's sleep. It's knocking you out, but it's actually interfering with the phases of your sleep. Um, so alcohol, whilst it will knock you out, certainly isn't the solution. And there is a difficulty at the moment during this pandemic and since March of last year with alcohol. Um, the sales are through the roof. 
And I think a lot of it can be because there is nowhere, nobody knows who's drinking what, you don't have to drive anywhere, there's no accountability. So any time can be wine o'clock, please. And I'm not here to judge anybody, but please pay attention to the amount of alcohol that you're drinking. And in an ideal world, start reducing it so that you have alcohol free days and you can start small and build on that. So it's not that you have to go cold turkey, but it's just to be mindful because alcohol interrupts um, interrupts our sleep negatively and impacts on our relations with other people as well. And this is part of self-care. So it's about minding you. So it's not just sleep diet, it's hydrate with water, keep exercising and making that time for exercise. If we're working from home, Often the difficulty now is we're working from home, but we were never designed to be at home in work with our family in the house and our partners in the house at the same time. So it can be fraught, it can be difficult and communication is key. And John, I know you were going to say a little bit just about communication when we're at home, or will I just... No, oh yeah, go on, and just before you leave that, because yes. you're, yes, you might, we just mentioned the, the uh, your, your own website in relation to sleep because uh, people might need some type of assistance or uh, information around how to go about conquering uh, sleeplessness. Yes, the reality is I could actually, I could do a whole talk or a series of talks on sleep. So I find it very hard to even keep on point because I have so many different points in my head about the importance of and what we can do um, to, to improve our sleep. But if you log on to my website, which is carolinecrotty.ie there is a blog section on that website and if you search for the word sleep you will come up with a series of different articles actually there are lots of different topics even on parenting or anxiety or stress or how to be happy or tips for calm breathing and um, there you know there's a lot of information on it and if you have any difficulty finding it or using it just send me an email it's hello at carolinecrotty.ie is my email address and if somebody wants to ask questions after this as well um, feel free to email me and I will get back to you with whatever information you need and I can include worksheets or whatever information um, so yes I was going to say about the difficulties at the moment we're, we're not really designed this is more part of life at the moment is not anywhere near typical or usual and the idea that we have turned bedrooms into offices um, is just very strange. So people are sitting sometimes even in their bed and working online from home while trying to keep a family out of the bedroom and somebody might be in the kitchen homeschooling and your adults trying to manage um, and juggle laptops and juggle copy books all at the same time. The one thing I'd say is the children don't teachers now mightn't be delighted that I'm going to say this, but children are very resilient. They will catch up again. The majority of parents at home are not teachers. They are doing the best they can to homeschool as best they can. And you're not a teacher. So it's very hard to become a teacher. You cannot be all things to all people. Do the best you can. If the day comes where you're actually going to take a mental health day and you're going to take the family out and you're going to have a picnic outside in the front garden and, or you're going to have a picnic in the sitting room, do it. And I'd say explain to the teacher, couldn't do school last Friday or can't do school today because we're having a day off school today. I think it's more important that the children are cared for and played with and remember this as being fun rather than it being an incredibly stressful, fraught, argumentative time for parents and children. Children will catch up. I read a post at the beginning of all of this and I was so disappointed I never kept on to it about a woman who had moved to Australia when she was 12, never spoke English and has a PhD. So children will catch up. They're remarkably resilient. Do the best you can with what you have in the time you have, but try not to panic about not being as good as the family next door. In fact, I'd go so far as to say, stop comparing yourselves to anybody. 
your family is your family. You are doing the best you can. And if your neighbors are excelling with the homework, that's fantastic for them. But that's not them. Comparisons will never work because you're not comparing like with like. So keep it back down into the day. Keep your routine, which includes getting out of the house. And in fact, for moms, I would be saying it's really important that you have time away. And I, I'm not going to say you lock yourself in the bathroom. The ideal scenario would be that you walk away from the house even for 10 minutes and walk back to the house 10 minutes. So that's 20 minutes just on your own with no one asking you where something is or how to find something or how to do something. But it's exercise as well as disconnecting from the household, which is something we don't have because we're working from home. That journey to work and that journey home from work and that uh, lunch time and break time was all time where we were separated from home. And at the moment, everything is happening all under the one roof. And so it's that's got to be part of self-care routine is to take time away from everybody, to disconnect even from your own family. So if you have a lunch break, get out of the house and walk away from the house and come back again. I've spoken to so many people and they're sitting in their cars because it's the only privacy that they actually have. There is no privacy to be had in their homes. And if that's what it takes for you to have a private conversation with somebody, I'd say go for it. Sit out into the car and talk to somebody. Um, so I'd say really this is all about um, letting yourself off the hook. That striving perfect per for perfection has to be... Uh, that has to be thrown out the window. There is no perfect in this. We're getting through, you're getting through to the end with your children. And that also means you will have a messy house and there is nothing wrong with having a tidy house. Your house will be tidy when your children have grown up and gone. And then you'll be hoping and looking forward to somebody coming to mess that tidy house. So John, will I call you in on the, the tidy house? Well, no, no, maybe, um, yeah, I mean, I mean that's, uh, I totally agree with that as well, but I suppose just going back to um, yeah. the time on your own thing, I, I think that that is huge, at the, uh, 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 particularly at the current time, during the current uh, uh, period we're living through. Um, if, you, if you're in the house all the time, which you are, and there's, you're surrounded by people all the time, the reality almost is, is that you're, you're in somebody's company and there's somebody watching you and looking at you. 24 7 and that's why every to my knowledge and to my belief is that every human being needs time on their own and um, you know if that's going for a walk on your own or if it's just sitting in the room on your own or sitting in the car on your own but on your own completely on your own it's just that thing that we need as, as individual people just that that's that time on your own period uh, for myself sort of job and i would definitely encourage you to to Excuse me, to structure that into your daily life that you have one or two little periods where you're, you're able to structure it in that this is on your own. I mean, can I mention that I talk a little bit about communication in the house because um, I, I said this the last day and it's just to re-emphasize it again. I'd be surprised if many people have sat down formally and, and talked about how they're going to live their lives in their new situation. Uh, mostly what happens is people just go on and start doing things and and appear like remember if there's people coming living working in the house now that wouldn't be there normally then that is a completely different environment than the one that people were used to and and as a result of that there has to be some understanding about who's going to do what when and uh, as you know so being reminding yourself means that you don't take on too much and that you're able to talk about the things that you're not able to do and try to get somebody mm. else to do it so for instance if the somebody is working from home and they need an hour or an hour and a half of, 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 of peace and stillness and quietness because there's something very important going on. Uh, when that's over, well, then that, that person should help the other person in the house or persons in the house for their period of, of, of uh, time to, to, to do what they need to do. Um, so sitting down and, and, and trying to agree, I, I'm, I'm big into trying to get agreements. If you try to get people to agree something, 
the one thing we said the last night, the one thing we would be saying again tonight in relation to self-care is the one thing that doesn't help you is arguments and mm. disagreements and yeah. confrontation. Mm. And we're we are very good at that. We're far better at confronting people and arguing with people than we are at sitting down calmly and trying to work out something and communicating something about who's going to do what when. And that will eliminate some of the of the tension and the stress and the pressure that you're, you're putting yourself under. Um, you have to mind yourself because the better you mind yourself, the better you will be able to mind others. And that's a very simple sort of a scenario and an explanation, but it is very important. So basic communication, and on top of that as well, because you're cut off now from your, you know, your brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and even your own parents may be visiting and, and meeting up for someone that you can just unload with, that opportunity is all gone now. And uh, you need to replace that with something else, if at all possible, that you have somebody that you can phone up or Zoom or, or, or meet in, uh, uh, around the road within this five kilometers or two kilometers or whatever it is, five kilometers, but at least... Uh, to be able to have somebody that you can unload to is, is huge because the more you're confined, the more stressed you're going to get and the more you're suppressing your feelings. And um, we said that last night and we repeat it again tonight, one of the great ways of dealing with conflict and difficulties in the home is to talk about how you feel. My, yeah. you know, I feel angry, I feel mm. upset, I feel frustrated, I feel let down. I felt let down and I'm feeling let down by but nobody can fight with you on that because you're talking about yourself. On the other hand, if you say, you're driving me mad, you didn't do this, that's confrontation. It's bound to end in an argument. You're going to feel a lot more stressed as, a, as, a, as in the outcome. Nothing is solved and only extra tension. So if you sat down and objectively looked at it, you'd say, right, arguing, confronting, yeah. um, all that stuff must be tried to be sidetracked and uh, try to replace it with some type of uh, structure that people would adhere to and it is it, it, a matter if somebody agrees to something and they don't do it it's a lot easier to say to them by the way you never do that job you were, so you were supposed to do that today or, or maybe even better say maybe you would do that job now that you forgot to do this morning uh, rather than you didn't do that and you let me down and, because that's what happens then stress creates more stress which creates more anxiety and as a result of that the house is a powder keg of, is ready to blow up and uh, a lot of it can be avoided and back to what we, we said at the beginning and what Caroline is just after saying, it's unreal to be expecting to be homeschooling, living in a house, working in the house, doing a whole lot of things, all the kids and all the family confined in the house by and large every day, seven days a week. There's nothing natural about that. And so a lot of the things that you'd normally expect to have in place in the house, it's not in place at the moment, simply because it is in an emergency. So don't be blaming yourself and putting pressure on yourself say, well, I didn't hover today and I didn't do the bed and I didn't do something. Just do whatever you can using reason. And what isn't done, just that's it. Just, just tell yourself that. I've done my best today. I can't do any better. And be happy with that and accept that everything is not going to be perfect because it's simply impossible to have everything perfect in an imperfect world. And I uh... am. Absolutely. I, I totally reiterate what John has said. I, I think often people expect that their partners know what um, know what they're thinking. You know, people will often say to me, oh, but sure, he or she knows that 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 annoys me. And it's not it's not fair because often we're oblivious to what somebody else wants because um, they haven't told us explicitly. So we can't be too clear. We you know, we talk about explain things to children but it's also important you explain 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 to the people that you live with and that John is right it is about I feel this way because so I feel x when y because z that's the formula and it stops arguments actually because if you stop yourself and what is it that I'm actually upset about often we can feel angry and agitated but it's not even the situation that's current. It can be something that happened a week earlier or the fact that we're worried about our parents or that we're worried about the contact um, with others or that we can't go to a funeral of a loved one, which is very distressing. So our usual traditions and norms are not in place at the moment and that carries its own level of stress for people. So it's finding a way of managing those stresses and that's why I'm that's why I'm going to bang on about exercise as well. Um, exercise is key to Can us I remaining in. Yes. Before you, so, you, yeah. you 
before you go on to exercise, just one yes. other little thing that I want to say about this yeah. thing is, if you, you know, if you're the, you know, you know, the person that's at home, the home maker, uh, be that mum or dad, but in the most majority of cases, still yeah. in Ireland, it's mum. But if you are that homemaker at the moment, and and and, and therefore there's a lot more people involved, that there's a lot more people involved in daily day to day activity, you cannot be demanding the same standards uh, from them as a, that you look when you're doing something, when I'm doing it. And um, you have to be more flexible, and you have to be more generous. Other people they won't do the thing as good or as well as you do it every day because you're the expert and you're doing it all the time. But we get so, and, and sometimes people are so well intentioned, like they think they're helping you and you think they're interfering. And, and that's where this whole breakdown in communication comes. But I would be asking for a little bit of tolerance in relation to, you know, if you get someone else to do the hoovering, you're bound to say, sure, they didn't have cup, they didn't have hoover. <laughs> they do. didn't move I'd be, I'd be better off <laughs> with myself. You didn't do it yourself. Don't be, you know, so if they're, you know, they're, they're, they're doing the carrots, of course they won't do the carrots the same as we did them. But that's about, that tolerance comes into that. You're going to get all stressed now. The person who's helping thinks that you know, you're being critical of them and they're going to get annoyed and angry. So instead of being a compatible undertaking, the dinner is now going to become an absolute uh, war zone. So sometimes it's important to be tolerant and say, look, when I'm, when this is over, I'll go back to doing the whole thing myself. But in the meantime, I'll take whatever is I'm given. And the bit of help like that is going to help to, you know, it's, it's great. But it, so it's it's very important to talk to them. And equally for the person living from at home, if they're up in this room, be it a bedroom or a back room or whatever, it is not their office. It is a makeshift facility that you're facilitating them to work from home. And they cannot and shouldn't expect to have the same level of support and, and all the trimmings and trappings of, of, of the office or the, or the establishment with them. It's your home. Yes, people are yeah. living there, and the first thing is to live. The second thing is to work from home, and 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 the third thing is to is to homeschool. And uh, but living is is the thing, and and survival for this pandemic. So I'd be saying very strongly, the fundamentals are about living and existing together, or coexisting, and everything else then is is just extra. But be tolerant and and try and be like, look, it's not as good as I would do, but look, it's the best at the present time. Sorry, I would, yeah, no, you're right. But I, I'd say that the praise is brilliant. Like this is something we're supposed to do with our children as well. And I know you will have said it, but it's to find an opportunity every day to praise your child that has nothing to do with academics. And I think you get far more housework um, done when you praise the person who's in your home for helping you do such a thing. You know, I so said that was brilliant. I loved it when you did do whatever it is because people are far more inclined to do something when they are praised. But this goes back to the plan of action, I think, as well, for the week ahead. And it, it's sort of the people find a way of disconnecting from work. So that if you are in the bedroom or your makeshift office working from home, how do you then draw that line between I am leaving work now and I'm going back downstairs and I'm mom or dad at home in the sitting room and that's how that's why I think we have to physically leave the house and then to come back into it again um John do you know I've completely lost my trail of thought we're going to, to talk about, about exercise the significance and importance of exercise I was yeah I was but in relation to I, I think it was because I was saying because this is a very stressful time and it does cause us to feel anxious that that's one another one of the reasons why exercise is key not just getting separating um work life from home life but when we're anxious we release this series of hormones that cause us to feel you know i think anyone being anxious by the way is part of being human stress is part of being human i always say that the day we have no anxiety or no stress or no reaction is actually when we're dead so at least we're alive when we feel stress and anxiety. But over time, it's not ideal. So we have lots of people will feel it differently, but I think we're all familiar with it, that churning in your stomach, that feeling of dread, um, heart rate increased, we might feel um, sweaty. And people are really feeling anxious now because when they go out of the house, they're looking at other people and they're wearing masks or not wearing masks or they're standing too close to them or they're too close to them in the aisle at the shop. So there are lots of different reasons for feeling anxious at the moment. And part of our self-care routine is learning to pay attention to what is going on in our bodies, but also how do we manage stress and anxiety and learning how to control our breath and breathing 
and exercising where we increase our heart rate, we're moving the stress hormones through our system, exercise and calm breathing are our two best friends when it comes to trying to manage ourselves and keep our, ourselves cool. Now, we often look at like our lives are governed by feelings, but we often look at the idea of anger or anxiety as negative, but they're not actually. Anger is very emotive. It gets us moving. It's our thoughts around anger and our thoughts, our anxious thoughts that cause us difficulty. So there really is no such thing as a bad or a negative emotion. They're all just human emotions. And if somebody is elated all the time, that's where it's, if there's a difficulty. If somebody is very down all the time, that's where there's a difficulty. So we have a range of emotions. There is nothing negative. There's nothing bad about them unless they're causing us difficulty or impeding us in our ordinary everyday living. And the reason I bring this up is it's our thoughts that often lead us to becoming angry and agitated. So learning and paying attention to your thoughts is being able to build that awareness so that you can challenge your thoughts. Even the idea of the next door neighbor is doing brilliantly at their homeschooling and I'm not half as good as them at homeschooling. That then can lead to feeling guilty. My children will never catch up. But the reality is that's coming from your thoughts. We're all assuming that everyone else is doing brilliantly. But the reality isn't. That's not the case. We're just doing our best. So if you were to start challenging the things that you say to yourself that are unhelpful or unfriendly, and if you wouldn't say it to somebody else, why would you say it to yourself? So if you're exercising self-care, you start with speaking kindly to yourself, being gentle with yourself, letting yourself off the hook. You don't compare yourself. You pay attention to your thoughts. If they are angry and if they are causing you to be anxious, well, then you challenge them. So pay attention, first of all. And if we've had better sleep, it actually gives us greater control over where we go with our thoughts. And it actually gives us greater control with how we deal with things within the household. Because you know that old adage of it's not what happens, it's how we react. And that is very true. So if we are calm and grounded and in control of our emotions and also living in the present, it gives us far greater control with how we react to others in the house when, say, they haven't done the hoovering right or our children haven't just stopped shouting all day and you might be trying to get something done for work at the same time as homeschooling. So there is a real urgency about exercising self-care because if it's for right now when the level five has lifted and the gyms are open and we are able to go out on to do whatever it is we do whether it's on the golf course or the gyms or meet people well then imagine how how we'll be like we'll be let loose but if we can feel good now and invest and build our resilience now we'll be even in a better position when level five restrictions are lifted did you want to talk about? No, I just say a little bit about exercise. I am exercise because I I'm absolutely convinced, and an awful lot of research would would back this up now. Of all the things, the best preventer of illness and and poor health is definitely um, exercise, along with diet and sleep. But just concentrating on exercise alone, one of the greatest th the things you can. Uh, pass on to your children the, the, the one of the best things you can teach your children is to be physically active um, i said this the last night i'm going to say it again tonight because it's so important that we make it um, absolutely a, a priority to be physically active every day you know most people working at home and live and, and home again mums at home and dads at home whatever they you know there is a lot of exercise they do normally but i'm talking about uh, you know conscious exercise every day uh, and and passing that on to your children um, and, 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 and 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 particularly passing it on to girls because all the research would show that most girls uh, drop out of physical exercise and i'm not talking about sport now i'm talking about physical exercise which might be sport, but doesn't have to be sport. But most girls drop out of physical exercise by the age of 12 or 13. 
And as a result of that, they, they, they don't participate in what is, is necessary in terms of physical activity. So I'd be saying to parents that you're, you're the role models for them, you're, you're the example for them. And if you do exercise and explain why exercise is so important and you're doing it every day on a regular basis, well, then uh, that is a tremendous example for your children. And try if possible as they get older to, for them to do it with you um, because it can be very enjoyable as well. Um, and, and any sort of physical activity at the moment is definitely walking because that's all you can do. But when the pandemic is over, that you can cycle, you can climb mountains, you can go swimming, uh, you can do, and you can, of course, play sports but, uh, and participate in sports. But it's so important to ingrain that, that thing into young people, that, that the greatest, absolute greatest gift that you can give your children is to give them a, a, a conscious belief and a conscious attachment uh, of practicing self-care for the rest of their lives, looking after themselves, especially their health in relation to the, the sleep that has been mentioned, uh, the diet, the exercise and relaxation and, and vitamin D and other things that, that are, are also important. But I would say, if you said to me, which one is the most important? I would say physical activity. At the moment, the worst thing that is happening to most of us is that we're sitting down too much. Yeah. Because we're in the house so much. So you're spending a way more time actually sitting down at the moment than you would normally. That has to be counteracted. So to get up regularly and to walk around the house or run, or run up and down the stairs or anything at all, some activity, walk around the house outside, uh, walk down the road a bit and back. Uh, any little bit of physical activity at all is, is absolutely, uh, it's invaluable. And it is the greatest preventer of long-term illness. Uh, and with your children, it's important to remember and be conscious that your children are going to live to be in their late 90s, if not to be 100. That is going to be the norm in 70 and 80 years time with medicine and, and, and technology and all the wonderful progressions. So, you know, so it is in their own best interest to be physically fit, to be able to enjoy that life, because that's what, what physical fitness does. It helps you to attain a quality of life that would make life very enjoyable right through to your 80s and 90s. So it's not just a short term thing, but you must start young and you must invest in it from a very young age to protect the wonderful health that most young people have. But what happens is because of a lack of sleep, uh, prop, improper diet, um, overindulgence in alcohol, lack of exercise and things like that, uh, maybe drug use and a whole lot of other factors, they actually damage their healthy bodies and they turn them into unhealthy bodies. And then they pay a huge price uh, for a very uncomfortable life for a huge portion of their life. So I couldn't emphasize uh, for yourself as parents, first of all, and then passing it on to your children, the absolute essential element, uh, far for me, far greater than any other education is to educate them around the importance of self-care for themselves. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and the other thing as well, especially for parents with children, bringing your children out with you you're far more likely to find out what's going on for them in their lives. You know, this sitting down, um, eyeballing somebody, staring at somebody, you know, trying to find out what's going on or what's what's happening with them. Not that there's anything at all happening at the moment because it's all so dull, but walking side by side is far better for conversation with your children because they're less inclined to realize that they're being that they're answering questions and they were just outside admiring nature strolling and it's a great habit to get into that you go for your Sunday walk or your Saturday afternoon walk um, and yeah John is right exercise is, is it's the protector but it's also when you increase your heart rate you are utilizing those stress hormones that are secreted and that's that feeling of dread that you wake with or that feeling that in your chest that you know that uncomfortable feeling so that's what your body is prepared for a run it's prepared to run away it's freeze flight or fight and that's why movement is key it's essential it calms us down um, I was going to mention um, just very briefly that if we can have gratitude in a pandemic Imagine how amazing we'll feel when the pandemic is over. And that is every day to find something for which you're grateful. And that can be the most simplistic things. Like we had a little sprinkling of, of snow here in Cork. It didn't last, but um, it was pretty to look at. So anything at all in your day that you can find for which you're grateful. And I'd suggest you write them down. 
So three things every day for which we are grateful, even in a pandemic. It forces your brain to view the positive um, rather than where we look at the negative automatically, because that's what keeps us safe from an evolutionary perspective. So to force ourselves to what was good in my day, what can I be grateful for? And actually, we can be grateful for so much. We can be grateful for technology so that it has allowed a talk like this this evening. We can be grateful for um, a roof over our heads, a comfortable bed. If you don't have a comfortable bed, organize a comfortable bed because we spend so long inside in bed, it will help and aid our sleep as well. Um, and I would suggest three things every day for which you're grateful, 21 things after a week. Well, Caroline, um, would you guys mind if we um, put a couple of questions out there? John is brilliant at answering questions. <laughs> Viv, do you want to go with one? Yes. John, yeah. there's um, a lady who's asking about teenagers and exercising. She has teenagers who are into sports, so exercise a lot, but at the moment she's finding it difficult to get them to do it in the current climate. That these, It's usually the norm for these kids, but now at the moment it's difficult. Yeah, yeah I'll take that, Vivian, because um, I, I know all about it, really, because my, I have grandchildren in England, and, and that's what my daughter is telling me all the time, that as a result of the lockdown, that they have actually lost interest in sport, because they can't go training, and they can't participate in team sports. And I keep saying, it doesn't matter. Take no notice of it. You, they, you, know, they, they, you know, encourage them as much you can to exercise at the moment. But this is a short-term thing, especially for children. It's not going to become the norm. And it's not going to become their, their normal uh, routine. When they, I suppose I'd be saying the main thing is that when they, and I, this might happen in the next three or four weeks, that when the restrictions are, are, are lifted a little bit, I think one of the first things that's going to come back is uh, uh, oh, schools cool. are reopen. And when schools reopen, the kids will get back into the routine of exercising the school itself, participating in sport again, and meeting their friends again. Because remember that they're, they're, they're probably depressed in their own little ways as a result of not alone have they no football and no uh, training, but they have no connection with their friends either. And she mm. was saying like that for her young fellas and they're 11 and uh, 10 and, and 9 and that some of the things they love is that when they go off to training, they can mess with the other young fellas and knock them on the ground and, you know, all the sort of tricky stuff that kids uh, love doing. And they miss all that. And as a result, I suppose, they feel totally cut off. I'd be saying to that woman, don't worry about what's happening at the moment. Uh, on the other hand, what I was saying is getting into the habit of when, when young people, uh, people that you have children who are in, interested, genuinely in love and are interested in physical sports, then that you have no worries at all. I'd be more concerned about the children that have no interest in physical sports. They're, they're as normal as any other child, but it's just to recognize that and that they do. I'd be great, and so is Carla, I'm great into saying to parents, give your children options. Don't be saying you have to play hurling. You have to play rugby. No, you don't. You can play rugby or you can play soccer or you play Gaelic or you can play tennis or you can play golf or you can play, uh, you can do athletics. As, so, but you have to do one mm. um, so that they have to do some physical activity. They can walk, they can run, they can do all sorts of things, but you have to do one. And that means that the child has complete control. But, but there's a boat and the boat is you must be done. So I'd be more concerned about the children that don't love physical sports and that are not involved in physical sport because the physical, physical sports will come back. The other yeah. thing won't happen unless it's encouraged and facilitated. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. I'll do the other one, Sophie, if you want. Um, we had another question um, and it was actually for you, Caroline. And it's from, um, it's about what you were saying earlier about, um, oh, scrolling's gone up too far. So you said earlier about um, it's not necessarily about what happens, but how we react. And the person would like to ask, how do you re recommend um, keeping one's cool when nothing is left in the reserve tank and deep breaths and counting to 10 don't work? And how does this person um, hope to prevent overreacting when they are already completely frustrated? Well, I know this is definitely John's. It, it is actually, I know it's, it's, it's aimed at me, but I know it is John's because John often talks about this um, and has a lovely little phrase that goes with it. Um, do you want to talk? I, no, go on, go on, I can. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I think the counting to 10, the reality is the counting to 10 and the calm breathing happens 
so that you are in control. So it's not, you don't leave it until I'm anxious. Often people go, I'm going to lose my cool, I'm going to lose my cool, or I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling stressed, I better count to 10, I better do my calm breathing. It's too late then. Mm. The reason you do your calm breathing is you actually tie it on during the day. You tag it on to every time you use the bathroom, every time you put on your shoes or take off your shoes. That's when you do your calm breathing. You don't wait until you're already frustrated and then go because you are going to lose it. You are going to lose it then because that sounds like it's, you know, it's incremental. It's just like uh, just another thing and that person is going to lose it. But what is it that that person's getting angry about? Like it, it, it's... It's like it's frustra frustration with teenagers doing something, but there is there. This is back to the communication again. This is I am feeling frustrated. I am feeling disappointed. I feel disappointed when I have no help in the house and I'm doing my best. This is about communicating with teenagers. It is about having a conversation. Once you lose your cool, you've lost it. Mm -hmm. Do you, would you listen to anyone who's lost it? Imagine mm. if I started shouting at John or John started shouting at me and I'm going, for God's sake, this is not, this is not what you said you'd talk about. Like, there's no lesson to be learned there. So mm. it is about, this is exactly why self-care is imperative. It's about how can I mind myself so that I am better able to cope with the frustrations of dealing with children. So it's, it is not what happens, it's how we react. And that is you say, I will come back to this again tomorrow. I'm actually feeling, you know, I'm feeling annoyed about this right now. We're the adults, we are the parents. So it's up to the parents and adults to behave like adults. So John, I'm going to steal yeah, your phrase you know, unless yeah, you're going to say it. And I just add to it in the sense that I was at a talk one time at work in Roscommon with this uh, woman who was the mother of teenagers and a youth leader as well, which was great because she had the two experiences. And I, t I stole something from her. I told her actually I, I, I'd steal it and, and use it because it was the first time I heard it. And one of the things she said is, to parents that night was, get used to doing this. When your children say something that's hurtful, annoying, uh, frustrating to you, critical of you, a whole lot of different, anything she said that your children say to you, get into the habit of uh, uh, not reacting, but filing it away and coming back to it when you have caught it through and when you're in a better, uh, you know, a better physical and mental condition to deal with it. And that is fantastic advice. Remember, it takes two people to cause an argument or it, cause, it takes two people to cause a confrontation. And as the parents, uh, or indeed one parent in the home, you can actually mm. control a lot by not reacting. And you could say exactly what Caroline said. You could say, look, at the moment, I'm so stressed out that I'm yeah. not going to do any, I'm not going to talk to you any further about this. I'm going to relax and I'm, I feel so angry and so fed up and so stressed and I'm not able to respond at this moment in time, but I will come back and we will talk about it tomorrow. And you'll be in and that, and You have to go back. I mentioned yeah. just that one of the great things to do is, is once you, I'm telling you, once you're conscious of, when you get conscious in the future of getting stressed, that's the time to start doing what Caroline said. This is the time to breathe. This is the time to call, count to 10. This is the time to go out of the house for a few seconds and go out yeah. and feed the dog and, or, or something like that. Something out and pet the dog because that will give you that little short break and you'll be surprised when you go back into the house again that you'll be far more in control. So it is about picking up the vibes when you feel getting stressed and this, this house now is driving me mad. It's not actually the house isn't doing anything to you. It's yourself and the people in the house. It's the interpersonal reaction and interaction that's causing the stress. And so it's, and you have a big, you know, you have a big, you remember this as well, as well as filing it away and coming back to it when you're in control and when you're feeling more relaxed. The other, um, uh, you know, the other very uh, useful uh, sort of a, a, a skill would be to always remember that your reaction, your personal reaction is generally going to dictate what happens next. I said that the last night and I'd say it again yeah. tonight. Remember when that person is saying something to you that you disagree or is refusing to do something or whatever, yeah, uh, uh, it's your reaction now that's going to you know, generally dictate uh, what happens next. If you, if you say something like, well, listen, I totally disagree, but I'm going to think about it and I'm going to come back to it when I'm more relaxed and when I have not thought it through, you will defuse the situation instantly. And that will mean that you will get defused as well. 
On the other hand, if you enter into this confrontation, your blood pressure is going to go further. You are going mm. to say more hurtful things. You are going to get a response that is even more hurtful back to you. And the end is that everybody in the house is going to be full of tension and anxiety. So as the adult in the house, yeah. uh, you have a, a great opportunity to redirect frustration, to control frustration, to reduce frustration. Um, on the basis that if it comes to the crunch, is a peaceful house more important, you know, or homework, for instance, or, mm. or, or, or things like that, or cleanliness of the house, or washing the cups, is that more important than a peaceful coexistence for the duration of the pandemic? I'd say the, the, the peaceful du uh, dura uh, period of, during the pandemic is the most important thing. Like, if we can have a peaceful house and the homework is neglected, or the hoovering is, is neglected, or whatever, I'd say so be it. You can start rebuilding that all when the uh, uh, pandemic is over. Um, and one Living other thing that I would yeah, want to say, that I think it's very important mm -hmm. to say this because of the self-care thing, and that is every every day I'd say uh, to, to people, parents in particular, I would say, uh, have some one thing every day that you enjoy, whether that's reading a book or looking at a soap and looking at a film, uh, knitting something, I don't care what it is, but some little activity that you have that you really enjoy and make sure that you have an opportunity to do that every single day. That is not selfishness. If you want to lie, sit in the bath for a half an hour and you enjoy it, whatever it is, you do that every day. Because for that period of time, whether it's an hour or a half an hour or even 20 minutes, it is something that you personally will enjoy. And you will come out of that, whatever it is, when you put up the book or when you turn off the soap, you will come out of that completely different uh, because you're going, you're going to have a happy period in your life. And especially when you're surrounded by a whole lot of demands um, and also learn to say no, even in your own house. Just simply learn to say no. Uh, there's only so much you can carry on your shoulders before you crack. Every human being will crack if they're over overburdened and overloaded. And learn to say, sorry now, no, I'm not going to do that today. I'm not going to do that tonight. I need to sit down tonight and look at Coronation Street. And don't apologize. Just sit down and look at Coronation Street because that's your time for yourself to do something that you enjoy. And uh, I would just, for that particular person, I'd say it's imperative that they have an obligation to actually manage themselves so that they feel better and more in control rather than feeling, what can I do when I'm that on edge? And I was going to say that often people will say, well, look, you know, we always get angry. And when my parents got angry, I'm an angry person. I'm prone to outbursts. The children are used to it. It's not, it's not good enough. It really isn't good enough. We need to be responsible for how we react and we can take charge. And it is baby step by baby step. And there's a lot of information even on my website under the conflict resolution side, because it is about explaining to somebody the next time I get angry, I'm actually not going to have an outburst. I'm going to walk away and I'm going to chat to you again about it. And I mean, it doesn't matter if you're bubbling on the inside, but just don't let that, that bubble over. And what are we going to say, John? I was just going to say that yeah. You'll, you'll still, I, we know this, from my, I know it myself personally, you're still going to lose it. I still lose it. Yes. Everyone else yeah. how not to lose it. But I still yeah. lose it on occasion. Yeah. The one thing I would say is when you lose it, you know, that the first opportunity will you just come back and say, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for yes. you. Mm. Especially if you take out your frustration on your children. Yes. I, I'd say, whatever about an yeah. adult, a partner being able to cope with it. The one thing that's very unfair is that sometimes we take out our frustration on our children. So it's, the child is okay, but he's coming at the wrong time to look for something. And you're reacting, yeah. he's getting out of my life. Now the child is totally innocent, but because you are stressed out now, you have attacked the child uh, or dismissed the child or, or said something very hurtful to the child. At the first opportunity, will you just go back and say, listen, I'm sorry. I was frustrated, I was denied, I was feeling so angry, but I, I am sorry. Honestly, it will make such a difference to the child and it will make such a difference to yourself being able to acknowledge the fact that I was wrong on that occasion. Because being saying wrong is a very big part of all, you know, dealing with the, with the problem or whatever it is. And you're also teaching your children that you're not infallible, that you can own up when you've made a mistake. Now, I, what I actually just wanted to give a couple of little practical guides to people. There are lots of supports available online. And I'm sure you've gone through these already. But Grow is a charity that has online weekly meetings that help people who are trying to mind their mental health. There's free counselling supports available through mymind.org. 
And if it's not free, there's a sliding scale of fees. It's a HSE funded scheme. And I would say definitely try and check it out, especially it's fantastic to have somebody in your life that you can talk to. Um, it's confidential. It doesn't go anywhere. You can offload. I would say nine times out of 10, the people that end up in front of me, sitting in front of me talking are the go to people. They say, look, I, I'm there for everybody else. I can't figure out um, why I'm even here. I, and they will say things like, I've never told this to a, a living person before. But having somebody in your life that you can talk to on a confidential basis. And if it is, if it is somebody that you have to, if it's a professional, so be it. At least you're getting to air, to hear the sound of your own voice, articulating your difficulties and worries and stresses and anxieties, especially if you don't want to put that onto a family member because the go-to people know what's going on for other people and they don't want to overburden people. And finally, text hello to 50808 anytime, day or night, and a friendly person will reply back to you. So having somebody at the end of the phone just to say, God, look, I think I'm losing my mind. I'm fraught. I can't sleep. Um, and it's confidential service. It's also HSE funded. So 50808. I hope that number is correct, but I think it is. Um, so text hello to 50808. I think that's right. I hope it is. But anyway, all complaints. I will. There are services out there. All complaints to Caroline Crotty. OK. <laughs> Thank all you, Caroline. We're, we're coming Thank around. You. Yes, um, I, I don't want to stop you like I, I would I gladly stay for another 15 minutes Um, the, the people have responded very well, you know, um, um, our, our attendants always stay for the full talk. It's one of the few um, speakers that we get and the full crowd stays because everyone is quite happy to listen more to Caroline and John. So I'd like to thank you both for all that you have contributed over the last two weeks. Um, John, thank you for coming back again tonight. Um, I say on behalf of everyone in Ballyhara, we've thoroughly enjoyed it. We have staff that even come to this. You can say hi to everyone out there. <laughs> um, they, they love thanks from Laura. And that's Laura in the chat there now as well for a very informative session. And um, Evelyn Flynn says, thank you very much. Um, great advice. Uh, compliment. We compliment each other. And they are, um, I, I will say, uh, Evelyn, John and Caroline are used to doing talks in public events together. So um, they, they, you both work very well together. I've never seen the two of you speak together. I have worked with Caroline and I've gone to John's talks and I heard you talked together from our previous um, role. And um, so I took a chance. It was a good old chance to take. And everyone is saying thank you from Rosemary and... Um, thank you, Kathleen. Yeah from Kathleen. So thank you very much for having That's us. And thank you to everyone who's watching. And, and just, will you just be nice to yourselves? That's that's really it, just be nice, just be kind to yourselves. Start becoming your own best friend, really. Yeah. Because we'd be nice to our best friends. And and I, then my little parting shot would be to say to people, look, just pick out one or two things that you heard tonight, they apply to you, one or two. Don't be trying to change the world and change your own life. You won't be able to change everything, it's impossible. Human change is very difficult, but if you picked out one or two things that apply to you and put a bit of effort into those one or two things, it will be life changing and it will give you then the energy to, to make other little changes if that, if that is necessary. But one or two little things to say, right, these are the two things I'm going to take from the night and these are the two things that I'm going to, to work on for the next two or three weeks. Um, rather than trying to take on board everything because it would be impossible to make all the changes. Yeah, baby steps, just baby steps in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so thank much for everything. Thank, thank, thank you guys again for, for coming. And thank you, John and Bye. Caroline. Thank, thank you, you, Viv, for Bye. hosting thanks with me. Million. Thank you, Jackie. And good night thanks. to everybody. And Bye. see you all again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for everybody. Bye.